Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Brain Scratch. I'm John Lorden, and today we're going to be going into what is known as the Battle of Los Angeles. And it really centers a lot around this picture. Now if that looks like a picture from uh, the 1950s film War of the Worlds or something like that, um, that's kind of what I thought at first glance too. However, that photo is actually from the Los Angeles Times. And you know, quite often when we look into um, alien conspiracies or uh, stories about aliens visiting, a lot of people ask the question, why do they always show up in the woods somewhere? Why do they always show up? Why don't they show up in a metropolitan area? Well, today we're going to look into a case where that might be exactly what happened. Before we get started, I have to give a shout out and a huge thank you to Mickey's MDN. Uh, she has been a researcher on other cases and I always enjoy working with her. Thank you so much for the help on this, Mickey. Now let's get started. And you know it's a good brain scratch when we start off with a source like this. This picture is being hosted at alien-ufo-research.com. They have a very good article that's a good primer into uh, this whole story about the Battle of Los Angeles. February 25th, 1942, in the very early morning hours, as a matter of fact, there's even still some uh, news coverage that is available to review of this. So let's hear it directly from them back in 1942. Anti-aircraft guns went into action against unidentified aircraft in the Los Angeles area shortly after 3 a.m. Pacific War Time this morning. The anti-aircraft guns began barking during a blackout ordered by the 4th Interceptor Command at 2.25 a.m. The unidentified object, which some sources thought might be a blimp, moved slowly down the Pacific coast from Santa Monica and disappeared south of Long Beach. Army officials declined to comment on the possibility that the object might have been a blimp. However, it required nearly 30 minutes to travel some 25 miles, far slower than an airplane. Watchers on the rooftop of the Columbia Broadcasting Building in the heart of Hollywood could plainly see the flashes of guns and searchlights sweeping the skies in a wide arc along the coastal area. Concussion of the shells could be felt in downtown Los Angeles, 15 miles away. So as you can see, and they're just giving you a very small snippet there of different news articles, this was major, major media news. And you might also be asking, um, why was this our response if this was a UFO that was approaching our coast? Um, it seems like we turned on the lights and just opened up fire on them. As a matter of fact, there was over 1,400 uh, anti-aircraft shells fired at this object in the sky. Um, however, to understand that, we have to look a bit into the history of what was going on around this time. This is only a matter of months after the disaster at Pearl Harbor. The whole west coast of the U.S. is literally put on high alert. Um, Anti-aircraft cannons are staged in certain areas. I believe there is four battalions that are firing um, at this object. The firing lasts approximately an hour. Um, let's get some more details from our good friend Wikipedia here. The Battle of Los Angeles, also known as the Great Los Angeles Air Raid, is the name given by contemporary sources to the rumored enemy attack and subsequent anti-aircraft artillery barrage, which took place from late the 24th of February to early on the 25th of February, 1942, over Los Angeles, California. The incident occurred less than three months after the United States entered World War II as a result of the Japanese Imperial Navy's attack on Pearl Harbor, and one day after the bombardment of Elwood on the 23rd of February. So Elwood um, actually is in the Santa Barbara area. That is just north of the Los Angeles area, a few hours drive um, if, if you're doing it by car. Uh, apparently, a Japanese submarine came to the surface and started opening fire towards the coast. Um, they hit some oil refineries. Apparently, it was not a very effective attack. There was no casualties. It's believed that they were trying to um, hit a station that contained a bunch of fuel and, and cause an explosion, and I don't think they even achieved that. Um, however, this did put the coast into a mode of being ready for another attack. There was some rumors that there would be another attack from Japan within the next 24 hours in particular. As a matter of fact, um, earlier that evening on the 24th of February, they were already at high alert again when they thought that they had seen something. 
that kind of steps down from that and then somewhere around 2 a.m. all of a sudden on multiple radars an object showed up. Now as you heard from the news report um, some people seem to track that object. It moved from about the Santa Monica area down to Long Beach. Some instances say that it moved northward again after that. Um, however, to this day, uh, according to you know multiple sources, we don't know what that item is. Some people speculate that it might have been a glitch in the radar system. Apparently, radar systems were not very advanced back then. It was kind of hard to determine the data. Um, so it might have been a, a natural anomaly that lit up all these multiple radar systems and showed up on them. Um, but that is, here's once again, the picture. Um, which is pretty compelling when you look at it, especially because you see all these light sources coming up to whatever this object is and stopping. Um, you, you can see especially how strong this light source is. This source should be continuing if there's no object there. And uh, it doesn't seem to continue, definitely not at the same intensity as when it reaches this center area. Um, some people claim to see a UFO in this area here. Now, there is a possibility um, because of all the anti-aircraft fire that perhaps this is a plume, perhaps this is some kind of cloud that's being left over there. I'm not uh, totally certain about that. But let's hear from some witnesses. I think what woke me up initially was the sound of anti-aircraft guns. I jumped out of bed and my parents were up. My father was an air raid warden. He figured this has to be the real thing. My mother was telling my brother and I, get under the bed, get under the bed, stay there. And of course we got out and we peeked. Um, there are some very good and entertaining documentaries about this. Of course, all the links are in the description box below so you can review anything that uh, I show you here. Um, but it's kind of cool that this is still within recent enough memory that we do have witnesses that are alive and telling their story. Unfortunately, their story is much more about the assault on the object. Um, very few people will even attempt to try to describe the object that they saw. Um, some people do think that they saw airplanes up there. There's been all kinds of different things reported, um, so it's kind of hard to straighten out what's what. Um, next up, we're looking at this page. This is um, by someone named Bruce Maccabee, who is doing a, essentially a photo analysis of um, the famous picture. And he has this great diagram here that's kind of describing the point that I made about the beams of light. He's showing here in kind of these dotted lines where these could be reflections of the lights that are hitting it from the underside. If there is some kind of object here, if you assume that it is metallic or spherical or something like that, it would certainly redirect the light. And it does appear that there are multiple, um, multiple angles where this is being redirected. It's a bit harder to see in the raw image, but I can confirm that he's not just drawing a bunch of crazy lines here. Um, he is identifying lines that you can see in the base image. Um, and you can see this image is a little different than the one that wound up in the newsprint. Apparently, um, back then they did uh, touch-ups, just like we do nowadays, where they would severely alter the contrast and brightness and uh, try to tweak the image to get the best quality. So this, uh, is, this looks like the negative, the original negative, although that hits a certain sticky point. Let's take a look here at UFOs Declassified, uh, which apparently is on the Smithsonian channel. There's a couple of copies of this uh, floating around on YouTube, so I'm going to include one below, but it depends on when you watch this video. It might be taken down at some point. Um, however, this uh, guy is investigating the original photo. He went to the archives where all of the original negatives are kept, and he found out something about the original negative here. So let's, let's check this out. At the archives, when I was looking at the negative, I noticed that every collection they had of these uh, negatives had the same notch codes, except for this one. Can you tell us anything about the notch code that is in this photo and why it's different? Yes, uh, this image has a single notch. It's kind of a U-shaped notch up in the uh, top right-hand corner. So this is the notch right here. So I have a, a sheet 
that shows the notch codes. So we have several different notch patterns, but the one that looks most significantly like this is the narrow notch of the Kodak fine grain positive film. And this would be very indicative of this being a copy negative. So what you're telling me is this negative is not even the original, that this is a copy. That's correct. That, that is incredible because everyone's research has been based on this being the original negative. So where is it? Where is it indeed? It's a very good question. Um, they go into a lot of great aspects. I really recommend that you check this out. Um, they're going to give you a bit more detail than I am in this episode and in, in a bit of a different direction because, of course, we're going to get more to the theories, uh, potential theories about what this could have been. Um, however, you really have to ask when you can't even get to the original source negative. Um, they also never identified the photographer, at least um, in their research when they were trying to track this down. It would be great to see if that person's still alive, if they can actually talk to them. But the fact that this is a copy of a negative means that there is some potential for it to have been altered uh, or doctored in some way. Um, that being said, there are other pictures, there's other footage that we've seen where at least the lights are certainly beaming through the air. We know that the shells were fired. We know that um, there are witnesses that can talk about how loud it was throughout the city of Los Angeles that night. Um, they even blacked out the city, so power was shut down. I mean, you know, to, to just go through that is traumatic, and there's people that still have those memories. So we certainly cannot discount that the attack happened. Um, the real question is, what were they attacking? And then now I think we have a bit of a micro question in terms of, is this print that is extremely famous and a big cause for a lot of the UFO theories to be kicking around, um, is it a good print? Is, can we trust our eyes with that print? And at least for as far as UFOs declassified was able to take it, um, they couldn't get back to the original negative, so there's, there's a huge question mark on that for me. So, as we usually do on Brain Scratch, you got any itches up there yet? Let's talk about theories. Um, some theories that kicked around are it was a military exercise um, and, and it was covered up. There are some military officials that reported different things. Some of them think that it was just nervous energy. Um, everyone was so wound up about the tension of going into war, about what had happened the day before with Japan, and as soon as one artillery division started firing, that pretty much keyed the rest of them into firing. They don't even know what they were firing at. Um, you have to theorize if there was some object there were they hitting it? I mean, you're talking 1,400 shells. These are trained individuals um, using the best equipment of their day. Um, are they missing it? Are they hitting something? Is there nothing there to hit? And th those are some real key pertinent questions. Um, some speculation does kick around about aircraft. I've seen that in a few places. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's even a report sent to the president that there were some aircraft spotted. I think this might have been to try to justify all of this artillery fire that was done. Uh, it is worth noting at this point that some people did die in this. However, it was kind of from side effects with the uh, power being all shut down at that time of the night. I guess some of the street lights weren't working, so you had a couple car accidents, a few fatalities in that, uh, a few heart attacks, probably people being freaked out by all this, um, you know, war noise basically going on inside uh, their homes or close to their homes in a major metropolitan area like this. Um, so I've seen some variations, but somewhere between five to seven people uh, apparently died that night. Um, in some form relating to the events, but nothing direct. I heard some speculation that, you know, maybe some shrapnel or some pieces had come down and killed someone, but I could not find anything to really validate that. There are people that definitely did find shrapnel, so we know that, um, you know, pieces of the artillery shells as they blow up did rain down on, on the neighborhoods, and some people did find pieces of those. However, I have not heard of an injury specifically related to that. Um, of course, the classic, and please keep in mind, this is before Roswell, but of course the classic weather balloon theory comes up. Um, and it just boggles my mind how often this weather balloon theory comes up. In this case, if there was a weather balloon that was sighted and they were taking aim and firing at it, I have to be relatively confident that our military would have hit that weather balloon. Um, weather balloons are not 
constructed of bulletproof armor as far as I know. As a matter of fact, you can even buy a weather balloon on Amazon. This is not sponsored by Amazon, but I just wanted to show you uh, how, how easy it is to at least acquire them nowadays. So there is something to that theory um, in that weather balloons might have been released that night. They might have flown in a pattern that um, raised attention because everyone was always already on this heightened awareness being on the lookout for an attack from Japan. Um, so the weather balloon theory does kick up. There is also some speculation that um, some police officers, LAPD and local residents felt that an aircraft was an aircraft was actually downed on some city streets. And there are reports that uh, seem to allude to this. However, there is no other information about those. I have not seen the reports. This is all coming secondhand through the, the documentaries that you can review uh, in the description box below. Um, but was there some type of cover-up here? Possibly, uh, especially if you consider the possibility that our military just had the jitters and was overly anxious. Um, I'm sure that the people in charge would not that, want that information um, going out, especially with us just entering World War II at that time. Um, so they probably tried to lock down some of that information. However, around the idea of a weather balloon comes a pretty interesting theory, a fire balloon. And once again, thank you to Mickey's MDN for pointing this out. I wasn't, I wasn't even aware of a fire balloon at the time, but let's check this out. From Wikipedia, a fire balloon, or Fugo, was a weapon launched by Japan during World War II. A hydrogen balloon with a load varying from 15 kilograms, about 33 pounds, of anti-personnel bomb to one kilogram, 26 pounds of incendiary bomb, and four, five kilogram, 11 pound incendiary devices attached. It was designed as a cheap weapon intended to make use of the jet stream over the Pacific Ocean and drop bombs on American and Canadian cities, forests, and farmland. As a matter of fact, I have a little more old-timey footage for you. Let's take a look at how the fire balloon works and how it travels. This is from Documentary 2. At about 30,000 feet, under prevailing wind conditions, reaching velocities of about 100 miles per hour, it takes approximately four days to make the crossing during the winter months when wind velocities are highest. During the rest of the year, velocities drop so greatly that a successful balloon crossing would be rare. These units have been found in areas ranging from Alaska all the way south to the Mexican border. Okay, so a couple of key pieces of info there. First of all, the range. They mentioned from Alaska to the Mexican border, California, certainly square in the middle of that. Um, these launches that occur from Japan have to be during the winter months. We're looking at February. It's definitely still cool. I believe that jet stream is still active at that time. So the time frame seems about right. Uh, also keep in mind, we had an attack the previous day. Was this some type of semi-coordinated effort by Japan to uh, have a multiple strike uh, in our nation at that time, quite possibly. However, so a little problem with this theory, if we look over here, the first flight for these fire balloons was 1944, and late 1944, and retired in April of 1945. Seems like they had a fairly short lifespan. However, in that time, they did launch 9,300 fire balloons, uh, of which 300 were found or observed in the US. Sounds like they had a pretty high failure rate. Um, I believe the idea was that these, they call them fire balloons because they would launch a bunch of them, start fires in multiple areas, and wreak havoc on, uh, on our nation. Um, but it seems like it was a pretty short-lived program, and that is a few years after the events that we're talking about in 1942. Now, of course, if they were in the testing phase or something like that, there is some possibility that um, they might have been using them. But still, we come back to that original question of, if this is a balloon of some type, why is anti-aircraft fire not enough to take it down? Um, or perhaps they did and we just never found it. Maybe if it was downed over the ocean or perhaps they did and it was found, but that information was kept secret? Maybe, let's look at an article from PBS here. Um, investigations into Japanese balloon bomb once again, citing that more than 9,000 were launched from Japan, and these balloon bombs caused the only fatalities on the U.S. mainland due to enemy action during World War II. Uh, if I remember right, that was in the Oregon area. I think there were a few people that were killed by one of these bombs. 
Um, the existence and purpose of the balloon bombs were kept secret from the American public for security reasons until a tragic accident forced a change in policy. So we know that this was kept from the public. That would definitely kind of coincide with everyone being so tight-lipped around this event if that was this event. Um, if, if the Battle of Los Angeles was taking down a fire balloon. This might even explain the wreckage that was found um, in, on the streets of Hollywood and by the LAPD. Uh, if they potentially found this item that was downed, who knows. Um, but this theory just goes so far. There's even um, a, a doctor that has received some uh, private confidential paperwork that uh, looks like a letter to the president where, or from the president uh, saying that we've identified that these are indeed um, spacecraft that are extraterrestrial in origin. Uh, I highly question the validity of that documentation. Of course, it's copies, so there's nothing we can do to test like paper type or anything like that. Um, once again, I just have to really recommend, if you're interested in this case at all, check out UFOs Declassified. They do a really good job of kind of exploring all these different theories. They'll give you a bit more detail about the military personnel and the stories that kicked around in there. Um, but this is where I hand it over to you guys. So. Battle of Los Angeles, 1942. What are we looking at here? Are we looking at a jittery military that's just shooting in the sky? Uh, are we looking at potentially a weather balloon that got them started and then they just continued because of smoke plumes that they were lighting up? Um, are we looking at potentially a fire balloon, some type of test of a fire balloon that happened before they were actually deployed in World War II? Uh, or something else? Is there something else going on here is it perhaps a UFO? Is this a pre-Roswell instance? Um, I'm saying that like Roswell is known to be a, a true UFO encounter, um, but this definitely seems to be a precursor to that. This is before all of the great UFO hype of those 1950s films that I talked about. Um, so it's just a very, it's a strange time for something like this to happen, the 1940s. Uh, of course, we've had sightings, you know, we did the Travis Walton story. All of that since Roswell and since that whole pop in culture around the UFO phenomenon makes sense to me. People are going to see that kind of stuff if they're uh, looking for it, in particular if they've been influenced by that type of art. But now we're talking about something that predates that type of art pretty significantly. Um, that's not to say that there weren't books about spacemen and stuff like that. So I just think it wasn't quite in the uh, pop culture mindset of America as it is now. Um, so I don't know. I really don't know what to think. I wish that there was some, there, there was some follow-up reports done on this, but everything is basically pointing back to either a uh, weather balloon of some type or jittery nerves on behalf of the men that were um, shooting in the air that night which, you know, is its own problem to believe in if you think about things that way. <laughs> and once again, um, I just hope that if UFOs did approach, that we wouldn't just turn on the lights and open fire, that we would attempt some type of communication with them. Um, but it's pretty hard to tell nowadays. I really don't know which way we would go. What do you guys think? If a UFO showed up today, flying in the sky, what would happen? Would we engage it immediately? Would we try to communicate? I don't know, but that's what the comments are for down below, so be sure to engage and communicate in the comments. I really enjoy reading them and getting all of your insight, and a lot of the times your insight turns into new episodes of Brain Scratch, um, so thank you so much for being a part of all that. I hope you guys have a great weekend. Thank you so much for joining me on this edition. I will catch you next time on the Geek and Dorks channel. Take care.